This episode brought to you by HelloFresh. Delicious pre-measured ingredients and simple chef-made recipes delivered to your doorstep every week. to know. Men like you made Terminator Genesis. Men like you thought it up. You don't know what it's like to really create something. To create a Terminator or a Terminator 2. All you know how to create is death Critic. and destruction. Critic! We need to be a little bit more constructive here, okay? Thank you, Jester. No problem. I'll be living in your kitchen sink until you need another cameo. This is the worst one. Genesis! Released in 2015 and helmed by a great Horb, a director, Terminator Genesis is described by Forbes as the best Terminator since Terminator 2 Judgment Day. I still don't believe you. This is the most pointless, soulless, Desperate re-sequel boot to ever come out of this franchise. It won over few critics and grossed only 89 million in America against a 155 million production budget. That's not even including advertising. And it's not hard to see why. This film is so complicated in its story, yet so simple with how dumb its characters are, that it's not even memorable as a so bad it's good movie. It's just bad. Even the worst Terminator film has some interesting ideas, or at the very least can rely on the charm of Arnold. But all of that is neuter like genitalia from Terminator Salvation. It's the one I hate the most, so let's not waste any time guessing why. This is why you'll see future YouTube videos titled Skynet Was Right. This is Terminator Genesis. Bet you never saw a Terminator film open like this. A narration about how the machines blew everything up. Before they died, my parents told me stories of how the world once was. Before the war with the machines. They remembered a green world. Mmm, LA? I'd compromise on a parched brown. We get into the Spider-Verse explosion as we're told the amount of people that died. Let me guess, three billion? Three billion people died. Goddamn Groundhog Day repeats less than this series. Perchance is there a John Connor in this future? His name is John Connor. Oh, good for you! I'll give credit that this Connor, played by Jason Clark, does look the most like Eddie Furlong with kinda similar eyes, but tell me this guy isn't gonna be the villain. I don't even know how yet, it's John Connor, the savior of humanity, yet the first frame I'm like, evil. The way they over-exaggerate his scar, the clenched lips, the pointy chin and nose. This is how they cast someone who's going to foreclose on the Banks' house. This actor is even described as always playing the antagonist. Have you ever seen a Hollywood movie, Hollywood movie? The machines will fall tonight. On the night they're supposed to take down Skynet's core, Kyle Reese, played this time by Jai Courtney, tells John how awesome he is at not being evil. I want you to know, Kyle, if there was another way, I would have taken it. Oh, and if you're not laughing your ass off at the recreation of this picture, turn in your Terminator fan card. We did not give in! We rose up! And this night, we take back our world! Today, we celebrate our Independent Judgment Day! So despite my criticisms, the opening of this film actually isn't too bad. It's visually very pleasing to look at, which is welcomed after the last two. I actually dig the redesign of the Terminators. They're a little bit more scrawny, which makes them a little creepier. And the action has a fair amount of energy to it. It doesn't look real, but it looks good. At this hour, willing to sacrifice everything! They take Skynet and discover the first Terminator has been sent back to kill Sarah Connor. Again, the film does a decent job recreating the look of the first movie almost flawlessly. Who should go back to stop him? Yeah, that boomerang guy could use a break after this clunker. She's a waitress. What? Oh. <laughs> Never mind. Again, a nice detail. He wouldn't know what a waitress is. But the writing quickly returns to a little off when Reese asks John what he should tell Sarah when he sees her. Tell me if you would remember all this. Thank you, Sarah, for your courage during the dark years. We can't help you with what you must soon face. Except there is no faith. The future that is not made set. for us. We so must be strong. You must you survive, you or I will never Sheesh, leave. I really should have written that down. Uh, can I condense that all to come with me if you want to live? He's 
intercepted by foreshadowing, though, as he sees an alternate childhood where he has a normal life. No way! A world where Genesis is still given as a gift. Now I know I'm in an alternate reality. <laughs> Remember, Genesis is Skynet. When Genesis comes online, Judgment Day begins. Man, those Sega ads would have been easy to combat if Nintendo had that information. <laughs> what Nintendo? Will Nintendo don't destroy the world buying Skynet? Sleeping buddies! He's taken back to 1984, again, still impressively recreating the details of the first flick, but... Oh, I think I found the moment when everything goes downhill. The original Arnold is confronted by old Arnold, old Noel, as nobody says, and he gets in a fight with him. But there were so many Hans to talk to. You're right. I did have an enormous von Strucker. Like before, Reese is chased by cops, but one of them isn't as solid as he lets on. Huh. I'd probably get more done if I turned off fake out mode. LAPD freeze! He sneaks into the department store, leading to a pretty cool mirror effect as the T-ish 1000 tries killing the cops arresting him. Gotta be an alien, like from outer space. It's a machine that kills humans. Uncuff me. No, you're under arrest. My mom says when you're arrested, you're it. No tape backsies. Thank God it's Biff Tannen telling him about Sports Almanac. Come with me if you want to live. Or a really lame callback. He's saved by Sarah Connor, played this time by Amelia Clark. No relation. And like many of you, I thought this was big time miscasting, but watching her at first, I was seeing a little bit of Linda Hamilton in the face. If the past can change, then so can the future. Honestly, I can say every performer is acting their head off with what they're handed, and I certainly wouldn't call this a bad performance. A dream of having your family back doesn't mean a thing. But it's similar to Katie Holmes in Batman Begins or Leonardo DiCaprio in The Aviator. They look and sound so young, it's kind of like they're trick-or-treating. Clark has commanded strength and authority in her own unique way, and despite these two were the same age when they played this role, this simply doesn't equal this. Especially when we're given the new backstory she has here, but we'll get to that in a minute. Hello, Calories. It is nice to meet you. Yeah, there's a reason Cameron cut that from the original. Glad you're trying to break what's not broken. How do they explain Arnold's age in this one? The flesh they put on the cyborgs is normal human tissue. It ages. Yeah, that's it, ticket. I'm old, not obsolete. Yeah, I saw that shirt at Spencer's in the old folks section too. So it looks like someone sent the T-800 back to when Sarah was a child to protect her at an even earlier age. Altering the timelines and I guess making it so that these movies never happened. Who sent them back in time? Those files have been erased. Oh, that's convenient. Yes, that'll be answered in Terminator Dreamcast. As in, it's a dream, there'll be a sequel to be cast in. So it's never revealed. Look, I'm down for keeping certain things a secret, but the whole friggin' reason the entire story exists isn't one of them. This isn't like not knowing what's in the suitcase in Pulp Fiction. This is like the S&M scene, with no explanation how the hell we got there. It's a pretty essential puzzle piece. On the plus side, though, the Terminator chasing them is pretty creepy. Lee Byung-hun knows how to give some pretty menacing faces and movements, making him a really intimidating antagonist. Too bad he's only in the film for a few minutes! Yeah, they wipe him out faster than the chances a Terminator sequel continues the story of the previous Terminator sequel. But who needs a villain when you have Reese's dialogue literally do nothing but state the obvious? Terminators only come from one place, the future. He set a trap. Looks old. This is not the mission. We can't stay here! Something happened. You could've shot me. Despite him clearly trying to give a good performance, every line from him sounds like the audio description of what's happening in the film. It's a Terminator. You needed the CPU from the future. There is a switch. You want us to time travel? You know you're not her dad. You named it? So we're some kind of suicide squad? Sorry, I'll let that die, and I'm looking forward to James Gunn's vacation from Disney. It looks like Sarah and the Terminator have made their own time machine. Yeah, easy actually. And they decide to go to 2017, as Reese thinks the timelines have been altered so that Judgment Day will happen then. Due to the memory he got when he time-traveled before. If we were exposed to a nexus point in the time flow, a nexus point is an event in time of such importance that it gives rise to a vastly different future. John Connor were to be killed or come... Oh no, no, I've gone cross They decide to trust Reese and travel to 2017 together. Kyle Reese, 
I've seen little to indicate that you're fit guardian for Sierra Kana. And you thought only WandaVision could let you down with a boner joke. Especially when there was a very clear hands off my Reese's Pieces remark waiting for you. They travel forward through time to save billions of lives by killing several innocent drivers in the middle of a highway. They're fine. They get arrested and are greeted by what I thought was the psychiatrist from 1 and 2, played by J.K. Simmons, but it turns out was just the rookie cop they saved at the beginning of the film. It's weird, he dresses like him, kinda looks like him, talks like him. That sphere, they came out of it. This is proof of what I've been talking about for 30 whatever years. Not gonna lie, having it be the psychiatrist, now totally buying Judgment Day is real might have been the only clever callback these bad sequels ever had. But I guess that's in another timeline. One where James Cameron actually watches the films he praises. Yes, he liked it so much, he'll retcon it in the next one. Those two were in 1984. I need to see the suspects. O'Brien, you been drinking? Because your name's O'Brien and movies. Hello Fresh was called the food of dreams. And it was. It really was. With HelloFresh, you get fresh pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. HelloFresh lets you skip those trips to the grocery store and makes home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. And that's why it's America's number one meal kit. I remember it like it was yesterday. Because it was. I'm Cookie. HelloFresh cuts out stressful meal planning and grocery store trips so you can enjoy cooking and getting dinner on the table in about 30 minutes or less. You can also get better value with HelloFresh as it's 28% cheaper than shopping at your local grocery store and 72% cheaper than a restaurant meal without sacrificing the quality. As a person whose mind is clearly going, I'm not a very good cook. But with HelloFresh, I can make cooking fun, easy, and delicious. I can still remember the smell of the fresh paint. Not that HelloFresh has any paint, I just like the smell of paint. Like I said, I'm kind of insane. But I know good taste, and HelloFresh tastes good. To a point where I'm gonna make you a special offer. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Critic12 and use the code Critic12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash Critic12 and use the code Critic12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. This is me thinking I'm an old lady saying, HelloFresh is the bomb. HelloFresh? Why, I remember HelloFresh. HelloFresh was called the food of dreams. And it was. It really was. With HelloFresh, you get fresh pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. Don't forget to check me out playing Kingdom Hearts Fridays from 6 to 9 on Twitch. Also, we've just added Tamara's Never Seen on Twitch as well, Saturdays at 5. We got content six days a week. Hope to see you there. talks about the latest technology called Genesis to a friend while he's patching up someone. Yeah, I pre-ordered Genesis weeks ago, downloading the second the counter hit zero. Yeah, I'll finish up your stitches. I'm just telling my girl about PlayStation 5. Well, that's your fault. When a lieutenant tells the doctor to leave, mid patch up. Are doctors like waiters in this timeline? Somehow you've gone so far off the grid that you don't even exist. They said they found no info on Sarah, but Reese, according to his fingerprints, is 12. Cal Reese was born in 2004. It's because he's the same person. Oh, this is what happens when you go to St. Elsewhere Hospital. We're all in the mind of a little boy. I am ordering you to shut up. You realize you haven't had a proper relationship with a human being since you were a kid? Yeah. Oh, great. We time traveled to a 90s rom-com. Yeah, well, it's your fault we're stuck here. I trust you. My fault? You Can't you see he lied about being an architect because he loves you, Sarah? <laughs> they each steal a pick to get out of the cuffs. But that doesn't mean we still can't keep this lame bit going. And don't think me holding on to you naked meant anything because it, you know, did not. I didn't say it did. Best Terminator love story since. They never did do that well, did they? But surprise, surprise, John Connor is there to totally not evil things up. Survival is what you taught me. Hi, Mom. Wow, I know you're my son and all, but you're the bad guy. I will admit, this is the one genuine laugh I got in the movie. 
Give these people beers! J.K. Simmons deserves an Oscar for trying to make any of this line sound natural. Goddamn time traveling robots covering up their goddamn tracks. I knew it. That's dialogue Leprechaun in space would have. Now we can win this. Son of a bitch plays the long game. He went back in time to protect Sarah just so he could kill John in the future. Tricky. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but I'm used to that in these films. Of course, John isn't dead, and what? He bad? Skynet didn't attack me, Kyle. It changed me. See, I'm not machine, not man. I'm more. I'm a soulless franchise. The only thing that can defeat me is originality, and Hollywood is all out of that, man! Apparently, Skynet got to John in the weirdest Doctor Who crossover ever, and gave him mechanical powers to heal himself. It's confusing whether or not they're controlling his brain or if he's choosing to help them, but honestly, I don't care. This is all friggin' stupid. Without us, you're never born. It's who? We're exiles in time. You see, I can kill you, for there truly is no fate. Yeah, I think the new phrase is no fate but what you have, Bake. And there's clearly nobody in the kitchen this time. <laughs> They try fighting him while being brought to you by Pepsi, and they escape while John Conman goes back to work with Cyberdyne to get Genesis everywhere. Cyberdyne will revolutionize technology with the ultimate killer app. Genesis. On the one hand, I like how there's clear commentary on how technology has infiltrated our lives with phones, TV, and social media. But there's not a ton after that. If anything, this was always the idea of the Terminator films, that we create and even embrace our own destruction through technology. So there's not much more added. If a Terminator was, say, like the Lawnmower Man and entered the digital world, that would be a spin on the idea. But this is just saying they're adding digital technology to the attack, nothing more. This idea would be explored a touch more cleverly in the next one, but as this film goes, it doesn't get you talking any more than you already were in the other movies. Speaking of talking, we still have that stellar dialogue. Old, but not obsolete. We still have one more movie before that. They load up to take out Cyberdyne, but John finds them and tries to kill them. Yeah, find a way to bring school into this too. It's not like it isn't boring enough already. <laughs> Get out. Now that would have been funny, but I edited the scene down. Here's how it originally played. Nice to see you. Get out. That one extra line just ruined the moment. It's like the difference between Indiana Jones on the truck going yeah. and him going Damn, I thought that was closer. Less is more when it comes to dialogue in an action scene. I thought this part was CG, but apparently they really did flip a bus in the air, so I have to give them props for doing that. Don't worry though, the rest of it is distractingly computer generated. Here's where we can see them. Um, come with me if you want to live. Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? Ah, that 2015 callback. Seriously, man, you and me, we're fucking done professionally. They're not arrested for long though, as John finds them, but O'Brien helps them escape. Hey, remember when they actually flipped that bus earlier? Hell with that, back to everything being fake as hell! This is like having just the one truck explosion really happen in T2, but everything else is done in CG. I think they're right, computers really are friggin' taking over! That's how choppers fly. Maybe if you're a two-year-old with a chopper in a bathtub, that'd be plausible. We did such a good job with the other callbacks, I'm sure we'll nail this one. I'll be back. What? How was that reaction supposed to make that moment feel cool? I'll be back. What? She's like, was that badass in your time? Because it sounds like a dad joke today. They make it to Cyberdyne and try to stop Judgment Day, but it looks like John got there first. There are enough bullets in the world to kill me. John Connor talks too much. That's a good point. Why don't you counteract that? We're talking too much. I was able to infiltrate the work crews on this facility. Only the magnetic quantum field is complete. Each time it ages, the clock speeds up. I was up. able to program your voice and hand Poly training into the biometric to program you to take permanent form. It's safe from the lowest level. You can access the CPU, it is harmless. Arnold's greatest strength, verbal communication. Skynet! Technology so dangerously advanced you can just hit it and it opens up! The countdown jumped again. We're down to eight minutes. Eight minutes? Can't it be sooner? I have plans to be bored somewhere else. 
They have a lame as hell fight, John turns into the mummy, and of course the Terminator sacrifices himself again to save the day. Oh no, he only died 80 times. Though here's, I guess, a legit surprise. He doesn't die. Great, the one Terminator I couldn't give a shit about is the only one who lives. I thought you were dead. No. Just upgraded. Trust me, I wish that was the case. Something something happy ending. That's really disturbing, right? You should see my baby pictures. Now one road has become many. A one thing we know for sure. The future is not set. Oh, trust me, it's not set. It's reset and reset and reset until you turn yourself inside out like the T-1000 and melt away into nothingness. Which is pretty much what this movie did. I guess I can't blame one direct thing for why this movie is so bad. It has talented people working on it who have done both good and bad things. It just has no interesting ideas or interesting ways of getting them across. It looks like everyone is trying, they just don't know what to do with it. Like they're handed this impossible task of making a good PG-13 Terminator that restarts everything while somehow doing the exact same thing all over again. I'm sick of hearing Judgment Day. I'm sick of seeing John Connor. I'm sick of being told timelines can or can't be changed. And most of all, I'm sick of callbacks that think they're being so goddamn clever, but they're just put in because they think fans will freak if they're not. Fans will freak out if you keep giving them shitty follow-ups like this. I'm telling you right now, there is no way this Terminator franchise can get any worse. I know I'm supposed to look and be like, oh no, not that one, but no, this is the worst. I'm sorry, I'm not following through with that joke. This is the worst one, period. Though this one's pretty bad. I'll be back. What? Hey, Doug Walker here doing the charity shout out and I can't believe we haven't done this one before. Uh, somebody recommended this charity. I'm like, well, I'm sure we, must have, I mean, it's so popular, and it turns out we haven't. It's a uh, Locks of Love. You probably heard of this uh, at some point in your life. They're very, very popular. If you haven't, well, let me educate you here. Uh, their mission is to return a sense of self, confidence, uh, confidence, and normalcy to children suffering from hair loss by utilizing donated ponytails to provide the highest quality hair prosthetics to financially disadvantaged children free of charge. Uh, with a four star rating on Charity Navigator and a reputation lasting since 1997, so they've been around for a bit, uh, this is a popular charity that knows what they're doing. And again, you probably heard of this at uh, barber shops or salons where people are, are, are cutting off their hair and they're gonna donate it to uh, Locks of Love. So, I mean, this is a very, very popular charity regardless it's still worth checking out. I mean, just because something is really, really popular doesn't mean it doesn't deserve even more attention, even more love, and, and even just, you know, support and thanks for all the great stuff that they do. So go uh, check them out. I, you know, when I shaved my head, there wasn't enough to donate, so I, I didn't do that, but uh, uh, that doesn't mean uh, you can. If you ever, uh, you know, chop off any of your hair or if uh, uh, you just want to donate, go check them out. They really do great work. And that's about it. I'll see you next time. Take care.